for here the people to come up yeah. and uh, but we really so it's all right. We'll, we'll just have to so uh, yeah. um welcome to you and how where am I three three two for us. Thank you. <laughs> welcome. We have just turned incredibly efficient today and we're running a little bit earlier. So thank you so much. It's not that some people haven't turned up. No. 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 We've got such a full agenda. We've got such a full agenda for today that we've um, kept it pretty tight. And so, okay. Yeah. Well, no. Uh, um, um, here representing the Palmer and Ray Park Association. Um, yep. I'm sure you already read our submission. Yep. Um, so I'll just go through the key points. Um, we are definitely in favour of option B, no frills, um, because the numbers we've crunched don't look particularly good. Um, however, the two options that we support are the Maurini land purchase. Um, we support that option of the $2.19 per year fund. Um, the basis of that is the council has assets on that land and it's also an essential part of the community, so we support it. Um, we support the Paul Wonga Tower, that's a locally funded issue, so it's up to them to make that decision. And we oppose the sale of the land in Wonga Tower. Again, the council shouldn't be doing short-term deals to dispose of land, they should retain it. Our concern is on the, the increased rate of the rates. You've given us figures basically of Parmanui for instance year one is 6%, but if you take into consideration the increase in fees that you've had there, especially boat ramp fees at $200, increased airport fees, and increased building associated fees, it adds another 6% per year. So you're actually talking about 12%. So then if you increase Put in the $293 you're talking about on the all frills budget, and then add in the 6% for the relevant two years after, you're talking about 34% over three years. So it averages out at 11.38% per year in increased cost. Now you can't call fees anything other than a tax. It's another tax, it's another cost, so you can't hide it outside the percentage of the rate increase. So, we'll move on to the rubbish. Um, we increase the cost of rubbish and recycling. Um, summertime rubbish collection, we support option one. Um, reduce the number of collections in Parmalee. Um, Support option one on the basis the refuge station remains open and fully operational. Yep. So, um, the Marbury Power refuge station closures, totally opposed. Support option one uh, stays open. Um, attached to our submission was a petition signed by 600 ratepayers. Total opposing closer of the refuge station. Um, Palmerie has two and a half thousand properties. Um, the third highest population in the district in the peak period, going to about 15,000. Along with the new building and having to try, try to 42 k's to Tyra is just not going to happen. Um, we're also already seeing roadside dumping with increased costs and tip fees now. Um, it's just just another cost that ratepayers got to pick up. <coughs> um, move on to fees and charges and boat fees. Um, Totally opposed to boat fees, but however, this was tried to be introduced several years ago in Palmerie and it was a total failure. Um, but I guess, I guess the issue is that 
We're facing a huge cost and a harbour cost because of the development of being done recently, the Tyra Wharf, the development of Royal Billy Point, and the extension that does that was done at Pleasant Point. So one, one of the questions is why aren't we using some of the land subdivision reserves that we've got of one million dollars to cover some of the costs of those where they've increased capacity, which you're able to do. Okay, why are we sitting on a million dollars using it to do internal funding in this organisation? Why aren't we using it to subsidise the cost of some of those projects and reducing the cost on the harbour cost? So <clears throat> we could probably accept $100 and a $15 day fee as long as it's managed properly and it all doesn't disappear in administration. Because that's what happens in the past. You introduce these fees and 50% of it goes on administration. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to go. Um, okay. Coastal erosion, major issue. We'll come back and do another sub, sub uh, proposal on that. Um, the other, the other issue we're facing is the siren removal. You guys have made a decision to remove the sirens, no consultation whatsoever, and there's been a number of meetings held around the district, and there's a lot of upset people. I attended one meeting, and the concern is that phones just won't do it. There's a misbelief that if your phone's turned off, it'll still, you'll still get the message. It's a myth. It doesn't happen. If your phone's turned off, you will not get the message. If it's on silent, you may. If it's turned off, you won't. So we have a lot of elderly people who don't have compatible, <coughs> compatible cell phone. <coughs> so they're going to be left in the dark. So my question to you is, and this, this presentation will come up again, why is Waikato taking away sirens when other places like Auckland, Northland, are installing new sirens. There's newer sirens just been installed in Oriel, voice activated. So the question to you guys is, don't you value the life, health and safety of the residents of the Coromandel as other areas do? So that's a question I guess you guys would consider because at the moment, I don't believe there's adequate form of notification for these high-risk events. Thank you, Bob. Um, so my question to you would, to you would be um, that you're happy that we take uh, those same measures that you're referring to for the sirens uh, and rate for that amount, that huge amount. So rate increases, not acceptable except in that situation. Yep. There needs to be further consultation with the community, okay? Yeah. <laughs> if you did this in two years' time, it might be a totally different scenario because the phone system will be developed and it Thank may you. have the capacity. Thank you. Robin. Um, and then Tony. I, I have a question that's not actually related to your submission, but to one that we had earlier from Warwick Brooks on the Tyro Pawanui Community Board, yep. where he suggested that parking in the CBD of Pawanui was at, at a critical stage and there was no parking. It, as, with your rate pad hat on, is that feedback that you're also getting from your rate pad? Uh, all, all parking in Pawanui is privately owned. The whole shopping centre is privately owned. So council has no obligation to do anything in that area. Um, there is one area that is road reserve that probably needs some attention, but is it a major issue? Um, you know. I don't know. <laughs> well, right, okay. I, don't, I, don't, yeah, I don't see it as a major issue. Tony. I mean, I, I see controlling the rates and the expenditure is far more important. Thank you. And, okay. and, and just one quick thing. We would consider deferring the skate park in Pawanui for one year, pushing it out to year four, just leaving 50 in the third year, just to help reduce the cost. 
Uh, but my question is on page 337 in your table, we've seen this before. Has your organisation validated the comments made in there? Right. Has your organisation validated the comments on the table on page 337 of the submission? Oh, that's the same. That table. That, that was attached to your study. The, oh, oh, that, that, that's, sorry. That's yes. Um, as far as I'm concerned, they have, yeah, they have, yeah. Okay. Uh, some of the information is incorrect. Thank you very Just much. One more question. Yeah. Yeah. Can you? I haven't said anything. I said Terry. Would you like to ask your question, please? Uh, I just want to know have the parking around Broadbilly Point. Is there sufficient car parking, trailer parking in that area? No, there's probably enough to cover peak period 40%. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? We do have none. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate you um, doing that straight away. And so we now have uh, Jules Pinker, uh, Mohan Singh, and Robin Bengali. If you'd like to come forward, thank you very much for coming in a bit earlier. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, five up two. So I can start now. Yes, please. So, uh, for everyone, uh, the screen, Mohan, Robin. I'm from Tim Taxi. One from Tim Taxi, and Robin's from uh, TV O2. Tangata Talent. No, Tangata Tangata Auto Trust. We are here to present on total mobility screen, which is not a fluffy item that we're asking for for a red we so just asking for um, mobility screen to be in place. So we've been running this service in Texas in for the last nine years, and we just really experienced this firsthand, uh, the need for total mobility, because we've got at least 50 people who will be taking wheelchair without wheelchair accessible but in taxi, so we have to manually handle them, which is not nice for the daily, you know. So we've collected 700 signatures so far, which is 500 online and 400 on paper by local teams people. And we've discussed this need with Wider Division Council, and they've told us that the implementation of this is with DCDC. And I've contacted DCDC in the last two years, and I had no response, so this was my last resort to actually write a submission to the council. So, Waikato like Regional Council has actually expressed a great interest in setting this up because they're currently running the screen, uh, screen in Hamilton, Tokoro, Waipa, Tokoroa. Uh, and I've used Waipa and Tokoroa as a standard because kind of like we are small town. Um, so what happens with total mobility scheme is that people who are eligible who have disabilities uh, can access total mobility scheme and that gives the person 50-50 uh, subsidy, so 50 percent they pay, and the rest of the 50 percent is then shared by NZTA Wakat Kotahi, and then the local council. So it makes like 20 percent from these budgets. And if we use the uh, wheelchair accessibility hoist on our band, then um, the whole thing is actually paid by Wakat Kotahi, so there is no extra cost to TCDC for using the wheelchair hoist vehicle. We've added a wheelchair hoist vehicle this year, uh, which has that uh, two people access for wheelchair hoist, as well as four other people can set to support them, right? Um, so based on that, if there is a $20 fee, then TCDC only pays $4, and the rest is $10 paid by the client and $6 paid by Wakakotahi. So the scheme is currently running in New Zealand, most of you would know since 1981, and it's successfully running across New Zealand, and we just want that for our people. And we appreciate that there is things connected in this town, but some of our people live on steep hills. They can't come down on the wheelchair to access that, and also wheelchair is not on connector bus. Um, and the taxi fares become too much for them to buy, especially on pensioners' rides that they get. So I talked to Robin and we came out to estimate the number of 339 patronage that we might get in terms um, because of small popular, small price here. And I used the figures from like a regional council's uh, reports 
on total mobility scheme from October, November, December, which are the latest one. I didn't take the COVID-19 data because that was manual uh, So on the basis of that, I extrapolated it to an annual figure. It comes out to be on the next page around 9,510. Um, so this is a request to council to just include that in the budget. It's a very small cost, 10,000, very big budget of the CDC. So, and it's not a fluffy thing. We're asking really important things. Can we say more? Can Robin add anything to it? Uh, so yeah, you only have one minute. One and a half oh minute. Oh my God, so that's me. Need more than that. Do you want to say that? Me? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, there's a number of reasons um, why I believe that um, we need it here. Um, for, for a start, we've got an increased older population, huge increase of older population here, um, and also the number of people with disabilities. Um, just talking about the connector bus, um, there's many people who can't actually access the connector bus. Either they can't get up into it, um, they use walkers, they might be in a wheelchair um, or the bus stop is way too far for them to get to, um, as it could be on a steep hill, things like that. Um, the, um, the, the total mobility scheme, once they've got it, uh, got a card, they can use it anywhere in New Zealand. And it is definitely in many, many more towns than, um, than it used to be. So, it never used to qualify for smaller towns, but um, now our population has definitely increased a lot. Yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, Martin? Right, so, if that's based on four dollars per person. Yeah. So this is uh, just an estimate. What happens is that you guys decide what is the maximum you will pay. So on the basis of that, the maximum. So just in case there is a um, fare of thirty dollars, then you guys have said that we'll pay up to ten dollars per ride. Yep. So then, the, um, so that still you pay ten dollars instead of fifteen dollars, sort of that year. So it works on that basis. So the fare can be fifty or hundred dollars, but the maximum um, is set by council. Thank you, Robin. And um, so I'm just thinking because. Yes, we know the situation in Thames, and you're a business that operates in Thames, but we are, um, we, have, we have other towns that yeah. also have. Would the card be able to be used by other services? And other, like if you had a mobility card here and you happen to live in Fulmer, or you happen to go to Fulmer, would you yeah. use the services? You can yes. use the service if there is a uh, approved provider there. Okay, so it's an approved provider. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you. So that's the next step. We are asking for scheme to be implemented and then there will be approved providers and people who yeah. will actually approve uh, for disability scheme, which will be people like uh, Robin's organization and yeah. age concerns. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Sorry, sorry, I've got another question. So but there aren't currently any approved providers on this There is no scheme, so there is no providers. Yeah. Once there is a scheme, then there will be. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. So, and now I'd like to place the prop and start to be found with how long is this one, please? Three one eight. Three one eight. Thank you for your time. <coughs> Yes. Okay. Murray's Okay. Thank you very much for taking the time. Um, as advised, my name is Blake Prop. I'm the Fongata Old Sport Club President. Um, our key operation is to manage the Fongata Mountain Bike Park operations, which is within the title of Forest, uh, three kilometres north of Fongata. Um, as per the LTP um, submission here, um, our main we have four main agendas within the LTP. Um, the first of which is to get TCDC um, support to have a pathway to allow safe access to and from the mountain bike club, uh, mountain bike park, should I say, from Fongmata Township. Um, that's easily accessible along current TCDC land, which is approximately 1.2 kilometres of pathway. 
um, the intent thereafter is to link in uh, Wakata Hakutahi to uh, do a feasibility study to enable us to put a tunnel underneath State Highway 25, which would enable safe access below. Uh, at the present time, the State Highway 25 is uh, 100 kilometre hour zone and just not safe access for families and children along that area. Um, it's potentially a, a recipe for disaster in the current uh, capacity that we have for access. Uh, so that's agenda number one. Um, sorry, my phone's just frozen on there. Uh, point number two um, is essentially we're, we're just looking for support at this stage for that particular project. We're not looking for any particular funding at this stage for that. We're just looking for TCDC to recognise the opportunity and the importance of having safe access to and from the mountain bike park and from our township. Um, we are seeking uh, OPEX funding on an annual basis uh, to support our operations. Um, at the present time, we do not receive any funding from the public sector. It's all privately driven through membership revenue. Uh, as well as um, any donations which we receive from um, public or individuals or private sector. Um, beyond that, um, the, there. Sorry, excuse me. Beyond that, the fourth agenda item um, is that the club is uh, happy to participate in the potential relocation of the BMX track, which is located at the Lindsay Road property in Fong Matar. Um, for the purpose that uh, that location, I understand, is to be repurposed for public use, um, uh, we could relocate that dirt into the mountain bike park to repurpose it to essentially <laughs> take it from there to the, um, to enable us, because that, that would support our current operations up in the park as well. Um, this TCDC cycle, uh, cycle development plan for town, um, we haven't seen too much of that. We'd like to be involved in that plan. Um, our position as a mountain bike park, um, there's obviously synergy there between what we do and part of your, part of your plan. We'd like to be active participants in that. I'm sorry, I was, I was okay. I didn't realise I thought you can carry on talking some more. Um, are there, Thank you, um, Blake. Are there any other any questions of Blake? So, have you got a multi sport park area right now? We do. We have a current lease with Rainier Matariki, who have a, a forestry block in the Tairua Forest, which is three kilometres northwest of town. Um, we have a two year revolving lease with Rainier Matariki. We've got about 30 kilometres of existing trail network within that uh, park network. And it's um, only one, well, two kilometres northwest of town, as I say, so it's easily accessible for town. Uh, we've got about 700 active memberships, and of that membership, um, that consists of individuals as well as families. So we've got about 1,600 active members within our club currently who use the park on a regular basis. It's awesome. It is. Yeah. We're actively. Sorry, did you give that explanation on I, I didn't earlier, really, I'm just sort of expanding on that now. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, we're also um, heavily involved with the local schools as well, um, so we do a lot of um, participation with the school kids to um, to basically get them out there using the park and creating, a, I guess, a positive outcome for the kids. Um, the intent long term is to create a high performance mountain bike program for our local kids, much like they do for the surfing program at the Fongta Area School. Um, so there's significant potential to replicate that successful model into another sporting project. Um, alongside of the Fong Matar regional or the Fong Matar play itself, I'm in, the pre I'm in the process of aligning all of the mountain bike clubs throughout the Coromandel region. So thus far I have on board YP, Coromandel Township, and we've had some preliminary um, discussions with Fidianga as well. And the intent is to create a regional uh, subcommittee so that we can work together on a regional, in a regional capacity rather than it being individual townships working kind of against each other. Um, and to date, I've raised enough public funding, uh, private funding, to say, to buy some assets. I've got um, some funding to come through, so I've enabled, which will enable us to get a digger and all the relevant equipment and the intent is to basically utilise that resource throughout the different clubs to build capacity. Good stuff. Uh, can I, no, we're not supposed to do this question, sorry, Martin. What are we not supposed to do? Uh, otherwise, just going to suggest, make a suggestion about talking to Diane Drummond while I know she's involved with Hoki Rail Club. She's yes. got other context. Sorry, Martin. So, sorry, how many kilometres did you say? We have about um, 30 kilometres at the moment. Yeah. Um, and that is spread throughout a significant block of the Tyrell Forest, <laughs> completely fragmented. But in the current area, which we deem is our core area, we have about 25 kilometres of network. 
And then is some of is that a mixture of existing um, tracks and things, or is that all stuff that you? It's, it's all stuff that's been there. The club's been operating in that in the forest for about twenty five years, so it's kind of built up over a period of time. Um, and so we've got trails that, that facilitate for children all the way through to um, expert riders. So we've got grade two right through to grade five. So, so we've got a good mix of trail So it's right. not sort of going across any of the logging. It's all within Pine Forest. Um, the vast majority of the area that we operate in was felled within the last 10 years, so we've got good tenure on the land before they cut the trees again. Um, we did. We have lost a significant amount of trail in our outer network from tree felling, yeah. um, but the intent is long term to reinstate that and create some additional network to, to supplement and support it. So I'm, I'm presuming that your trails will be um, rotational based on forestry cut. Yeah, well, the good thing is, as I say, we've essentially got tenure for the next 25 years or yeah. until the end of the next cycle yeah. because they've recently gone through and fell most of the area. So um, it's not like we've got a short term position before we lose the trails. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you so much, Blake. Thank you. 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 So, Marge, we'd, we'd like to you, you to present now you, to enable your other appointment to be met. Uh, what page are we on? So, we're on page 677. Okay, thank you. So, Marge, the floor thank, is thank you. I hope you can see me. Uh, yeah, and my, can. Cam, my camera on, I can see all of you, so this is working very well. Um, thank you for your time. I will be brief. Um, I'm really following on uh, on a theme I think I've raised for in several form already um, around the boardwalk proposals for Whangamata, um, particularly as they are proposed to extend um, beyond the current uh, proposals, um, approved proposals uh, for around the Esplanade. Um, remain very concerned that um, there's a line item only in the long-term plan, nothing to give um, immediate or confident um, links to information about exactly what the budget um, line item in involves. Um, have an ongoing concern about proposals to do anything structural in that 4 June area. It's a mature 4 June um, there are dotterals breeding there. Uh, the information councils had um, about the ecological values there has been a desk-based exercise um, and has not mentioned the breeding dotterals. We have photos of baby dotterals um, on the walk, current um, informal walkway in the dunes um, near Access 6. So um, th those dunes should be left to um, perform as dunes, provide the natural hazard defence that they do provide. Um, we've seen already what happens when you put wooden and other structures um, and you have erosion and you have them exposed. We saw that along the main part of the Whangamata beach not very long ago. So very keen that this item not be progressed um, and included in the long-term plan. That then has a whole lot of run-on um, implications for uh, some very vague comments that are currently in the reserve management plan. Um, so uh, keen that we don't proceed with that um, and that, that, that it sits with your no-fills budget. Um, and I think that's probably the same for a number of other things that are in the plan, that it's very hard for those reading it to understand uh, what that budget actually is for. Um, so, you know, the difficulty in knowing what um, what's proposed for Beach Road, coastal hazard protection, absolutely no idea, but it's just a number. Um, so, you know, links would be very helpful in future documents so people can see what it is that items are for. You know, that created a lot of problem last time round with annual plan. Um, and the consultation that occurred about the Whangwantā boardwalk. I'm sure you'll be aware how how um, challenging that was for the community to find a line item hidden somewhere way back had been taken as being approval from the community for a fairly significant and impactful, in a bad way, project um, without a lot of engagement. So um, just raising that flag yet again about the need to not have surprises sprung on the community. Um, through this sort of process. 
Um, other things in my um, submission, you're certainly keen to hear you thinking about some proposals around wheelie bins to for waste. Um, it's an ongoing problem with seagulls and, and animals with um, bags and around the around the community. And so keen to support that if that's something you are going to progress thinking about. So I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thank you, Margie. Um, I do have one question. Do you not see boardwalks actually uh, helping to protect the dongles by keeping people onto a, onto a specific pathway? So what the boardway and the, the assessment you have had, the ecological assessment says you, know, you want to keep people away from those areas. If you put the boardwalk, well, there'll be far more people accessing that area than currently do, and it will be noisy. It'll be skateboards. It'll be you know a lot of bikes and a um, whole lot of activity. Um, the the dotterels are, are nesting very close to the current informal uh, walkway, which is used primarily by people on foot people walking their dogs on leads mostly, a um, few people okay. attempting okay. not successfully to cycle. Yep. Thank yeah. you. Are there yep. any other questions of Margie? There have been none. Thank you very much, Margie. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. I gather you're ahead of time, so that's always good, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, next, Donald Nelson. Yes. Donald Nelson. On behalf of Whangapara Beach Fat House Association, and you're taking the two submissions. Well, he has one that's his. Yeah. You want to do both at the same time? Well, it's, it seems uh, efficient to everyone. <laughs> I'm not going to change my personality, I don't think. Before. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, that's done. Um, Donald Nelson, you're taking the two submissions. Yes. Yeah. 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 Hi, I'm Donald Nelson. Um, I'm the chairperson of the Beach Rate House Association. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to make submissions on behalf of the association. Uh, we're an organisation that's uh, been around since 1967. We've got about 175 active members at the moment. Um, the first point I want to make is that we noticed in the long term plan there's been a focus on reducing services and capital projects while raising rates little focus from our perspective on focusing on improving efficiency. Having observed four capital projects in the Whangapoa area, we believe there are major savings to be had in project management, appropriate consultation and commitment to timelines. And a couple of examples. The Mary K. Tahi Reserve. The last reserve uh, plan was established in 2008. And large sections of it have not been implemented. In addition, TCDC and the community have been through long involved processes, including multiple public meetings, two draft plans, submissions, a survey, all to develop a plan for this reserve, only for it not to be implemented. Initially because of slowness of delivery, and then a lack of awareness of the law regarding archaeological requirements, and then COVID. And yet, just last month, maybe the month before, uh, both TC and the community put more time and energy and money into yet another strategic plan for this reserve. We would suggest a greater focus on efficient implementation would be a better use of resource. Um, I was involved with the Matarangi Waste Working Group. This is a second example. This group met intermittently for almost four years apparently a necessary consultation step before applying for consent. The meetings must have been expensive because typically there were multiple outside consultants, TCD staff, WRC member, and the meetings were also intended by the representatives of the iwi community, ecological groups, and yours truly. From my perspective, the meetings meandered through the process with an apparent lack of direction or urgency. The developer left after two meetings, saying he didn't have time for them. We continued. The consent was finally lodged in May 2020, which was two years after the original date, the intended date for, uh, for registering. The association believes that major efficiencies can be made with more appropriate consultation and project management skills. 
I'm sorry to start with some tough love, but you know, that's how we see the implementation of those projects. And now specific feedback on the on the various issues raised in your deck. Firstly, I think the deck was an excellent uh, approach and uh, allowed for good feedback and comment. Um, the no frills budget, the only point that I want to raise there is about the reserve, the Mary Tahi Reserve. This is the main reserve in Fongapoa. It's the centre of the village and it's an absolute mess. Um, however we got there, this needs to be fixed. The association strongly recommends that the Mary Tahi Reserve uh, upgrade be restored to the Capital Works Program and the agreed plan be implemented. If this is not possible, then at the very least a significant work program is needed to blend the new toilet and its tanks into the reserve. The association does not feel it can comment on other nice-to-haves, so-called labelled nice-to-haves in the, in the deck, because we believe most of those are local issues and we don't feel we have confidence to be able to make comment on them. But we do suspect that many of these projects are in fact must do to do and in principle agree to an increase in the capital budget, the capital program. And then we jump straight through to issue five, increasing the cost of rubbish and recycling. The Matarangi Refuse Station, the association supports the continuation of the Matarangi Refuse Station as it is a critical role in recycling. And then on to the subject <laughs> I least like to talk about in my life, it seems, talking about the mollocks. Oh, oh, right. The association strongly supports the retention of the mollocks of both Pongapoa and Apito Bay. As Council is aware, the mollocks are controversial, generating strong opinions, both for and against. The vast majority of the community want the mollocks to stay, and the association gives four pieces of evidence to support that. And most of which has been supplied by your organisation, by the way. 2013, TCDC commissioned a report on the Fongapoa Mollocks with five options. The most popular one was to they were to stay exactly where they are. In 2016, our association hired a professional marketing researcher to survey the whole community. The outcome: 95% wanted the Mollocks to stay, five wanted them to go. He said in 40 years of researching, he'd never come across a topic which was so diverse where everybody had an opinion. There was no middle ground whatsoever. Um, in 2019, at a public meeting site, which was part of a community involvement to develop a plan for the reserve, on a show of hands, 51 for the Mollocks to stay, three for them to go. Donald, Donald, do you want to just move your presentation into the one slot, or do you want two separate slots? Because oh, look, it'd probably be easier if I just had. I, 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 the, the, the association one is more important. The one slot. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm, so I'm being a bit talkative. I'm sorry. No, you've got four, four, five minutes. Um, 2019, the TCDC survey, which was part of the de plan development, only 5% voted for relocation of the Mollocks. There were other options, but only five said they wanted to move off. The Mollocks are strongly supported by the community and have generally worked well. Location is of concern, but no more suitable location is currently available. Having blue rubbish bags left out for days outside residence has been destroyed by pests and bird. It's not seen as an option. The location of the Mollocks means they're used by visitors. Two other issues. The tsunami sirens, as a background, as you're aware, the Coromandel East Coast is vulnerable to earthquakes and tsunami as it's close to its tectonic plate edge. <coughs> Cell phone coverage is patchy on the Coromandel, especially in Fongapol. As a holiday destination, many people do not carry no mobile phones to the beach, swimming, or out walking. Tsunamis are of known civil defence risk, and as such, we believe TCDC are legally required to mitigate against and be in a state of readiness to respond. 
an alert system which relies solely on mobile phones is, in our opinion, not sufficient to, to a beachfront and low-lying community like North Pole. The association supports upgrading and replacing the sirens to the national standard and for the sirens to remain. The last point is the cost of sand scrapes. Um, as the Council is aware, the association has been at the forefront of using sand scrapes to protect the sand dunes at Fongapoa, including the front res reserves, which are technically TBC, TCDC's responsibility. The cost of these scrapes have been met by front beach owners, most of whom are members, and this has been a successful program up till now. But one of the effects of climate change is an increased incidence of storm and corresponding damage to coastline, including the sand dunes. In the short and perhaps medium term, sand scrapes will be part of the restoration and, uh, and support for the dunes. Sand scrapes create both a private and a public good. If their frequency and scope greatly increases, the funding model needs review. At the moment, if your property is in front of the scope, uh, is where the scrape's happening, you pay a share of. And then we, so we come along the front of the beach and we've got residents, and then we've got the TCDC reserve, and then we've got more residents. Well, at the moment, the residents are meeting the full cost. The reserve in the bit in the middle, we're covering that, or the front beach owners. I'm not a front beach owner, I'm not that rich, um, but, um, uh, I, and I admire what they've done, but I just don't believe the model is sustainable if beach scrapes become more frequent. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Um, any questions, Robert? Yes, um, We yeah. have got talk this morning. We had some other residents in yes. Park come and talk to us about the model. Yes. Um, it's been a hot topic. We love them. Um, but it's, um, we're talking about them. But they had concerns about the amount of rubbish that gets piled up. And, and so what I, I don't want you to come up with a solution now, but has that already been addressed in the previous conversations that you've had about the mollusks and how we can get them working better? And if it hasn't and they do stay, obviously there are problems, is there a willingness to work with us and for us to work with you to, to sort out what those issues are so that we can absolutely. just put it to bed once and for all? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. John, that's why. Hey, Don, I guess your like or dislike of those mics depends on your proximity to them. And if I can just share with you, uh, the other council have pictures of the mics obviously taken during December and, and long weekends. Would that be pretty typical? Uh, this year was particularly bad. Mm. We had a breakdown of the truck that was coming to deliver. So we had two Friday deliveries with collections which didn't happen. Mm. And on those days, things, uh, on those weeks. The other thing is, in the past, the months have been emptied up to three times a week. I was just going to lead into that, Don. So, um, if there's a problem during those peak times, an extra service to those monarchs would actually assist. And if you, would that be the case, it would assist. In the past, there were more. This yeah. year, they were, they were reduced to only one collection a week. So, do you think the residents in uh, rate payers and Fong would accept a targeted rate for those additional services? Um, they would be challenged by the fact they don't think they get value for money now. Oh, they I, get I, would, I, would, I would support that personally. Yeah. So the association would support it. Yeah, yeah. there's nothing that comes for free. It just, in, um, I, 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 yes, it is a question. I'm trying to phrase it so you don't jump on me. <laughs> <laughs> what do I to think about? It. Oh, that, that is, that is um, in, in your opinion, not an ideal place for those monarchs to live? If I put aside my association's hat and stand here as Donald Nelson, I think one of the things it does is it forces people to acknowledge recycling. It forces people to not acknowledge. Um, and I think transparency is a useful thing. I think in a certain extent, hiding them away somewhere would 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 make would lead to more abuse rather than less. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, well, just following on from that as a supplementary, um, so you think it's good to have a transfer station at the entrance to your beach? I, do, I, I think being, being 
transparent with work in your life. Yeah, no, I got that. <laughs> Thank you, Murray. Donald, you say, and I quote, Siren should be upgraded to the national standard. Yeah. What is the national standard? The national standard, as I understand it, has been issued by the, the department. Yes. Yeah, and, yes. and, and, and that's, I mean, I'm not an expert. Well, we don't understand. Well, reading the motion, I don't think there is an national standard. I'm Gary, the director. Come on, Gary. I'm going to ask everything there we have now. Yes. We need that money. Let's just turn them off. We don't need it at all. Okay. We don't need it. As I understand it, we don't need it. Jerry, Jerry. Uh, just to the, the monarchs. Yeah. Um, is the glass still collected in the monarchs or is, it, is, it, is, is that no? That's stop? separate. That is separate. And that's worked better since that's happened? Yeah. It's um, talking to the residents. Um, the, um, the noise is significantly less. Yes, right. Uh, and, um, yeah. Our recycling rates in glass, I would. I would suggest have come down, but mm. but uh, it, it has, yeah. as the consumption. No, 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 that was a question. <laughs> well, my consumption has <laughs> remained consistent. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time. That's all right. Right, Laura. Uh, uh, is it Laura? Yeah, Laura Mountjoy. Laura, please come forward. Four six six. Thank you, Laura. I'm here to um, talk in support of my submission and that of many of my other Coromandel and other area of that people, Northern Coromandel people, that we really need a bus. We really need a bus, and we're really happy that the community board has understood this. We have I was just talking to a friend who came down with me and she said she's lived in Coromand for 40 years and she feels more isolated than she, even though we've now got lots of cafes and things, she has no public transport to get us out of Coromand. And I mean, we'd ideally like to have a daily service to Thames and to um, Hamilton, which is a big issue for people, but to start with, we'd really just like to be able to get Coromand from Coromand to Thames by bus. And the community board has put aside over, just over $30,000 towards this because they see the point of it. Um, I understand the regional council is looking at how they can contract the service three days a week, which is, from my personal point of view, not as much as I'd like, but certainly better than uh, nothing at all. Um, and But in order for this to happen, the council needs to approve it take it forward, my understanding is take it forward to the Regional Council and ideally put a bit of extra money into it. I'd like to point out that the service covers people from the Northern Coromandel, North of Coromandel, Coromandel itself, people from Manaya, who I think have also put in a submission um, approving this and I've had quite a lot of feedback from people from Manaya from the community there and everybody else on the Thames Coast who would also have transport here. Um, most people say, yes, it would be good for pensioners to be able to get to the hospital, and I agree. Um, I actually, when I shifted from Colville, where I was living to Coromandel, I bought a house close enough to town so I could walk to the bus. There's now no bus. I still can drive, but I can see a time when I might not be able to. And I am one of many pensioners, many of whom don't have a lot of money, some of whom can't drive. But I'd just like to point out that there are other people who want a bus. It's not just a service to medical things. I mean, just in the last few days, during the school holidays, a friend from Cole came. Busy people, a very busy family. They had to take their teenage son a three-hour drive both ways to Thames to get a bus to visit his grandmother. I know of other people, one woman who's son who's disabled lived in Hamilton, but he's still not going to be able to get there, but hopefully one day there'll be a bus. He used to come fortnightly to visit his parents in Coromandel. They're getting old. They have to drive to get him now. That's this, basically a five or six hour drive to pick up their son and bring him. So it's not just people getting to, I mean, it is people getting to appointments, getting to do shopping, just getting out as well, if you don't have a car. 
or, or you don't necessarily always want to ask somebody. I mean, you know, it is about independence as well. It's about independence for teenagers who need to go and go to a sports occasion or see somebody, for family, for friends to come up. And it's also for, well, I know that places like the Buddha Centre and Kogel, they rely on people coming sometimes from overseas when we have people from overseas. Otherwise, they have no way of getting, if they get to Coromandel, it's a lot easier to pick them up than if they have to come from go to test to pick them up. Um, so what I am really asking for, and we are asking for, for many people, I, mean, I think there were a lot of submissions, and partly that was because people were awake to the fact that this was happening. I think there would have been more if we had put more energy into it, because pretty much everyone that I speak to and that we know about thinks that a bus is an essential service. Um, uh, yeah, and it's not just the teams either. I mean, this is the thing. When we did have a bus, I used to get it to go to the airport. You could actually get the bus to the team and get a bus to um, Manukau and get a bus to the airport because at my family in Wellington, I could get a bus to Auckland. Now we can't. Now we have to drive. Um, so what we're asking for is that the council take this seriously, that they promote it, put it forward to the regional council and preferably put some extra money in because they're looking at a contract that would be pretty tight with just the money that the community board is offering. And as I say, and a little bit from Thames, I'm sure. I mean, I talked to somebody in the shop the other day. She said, I'd love to go to Coromandel for a visit. I'd love to go and stay at night. I don't have a car. How do we get there? You know, this is it. We just isolated the cost of this. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Martin. So, I mean, ideally you'd like it more days, but what I'm hearing is three days would be a good start. It would be a good start. And it would certainly, I mean, the advantage for me, I've been involved in public transport in the past, previously really, but what I noticed then was the more reliable and regular a service is, the more people use it because they know they just have to turn up at the bus stop on any day and there's a bus. So if they have to plan their lives, there are quite a lot of people who are not that great at planning their lives, and they're quite often the ones who need that service. So ideally, definitely, I'd like it to be daily, but um, if all we can have at this point in time is three days a week, it's better than nothing. That's where I am really. Any other questions for Laura? Thank you very much, Laura. Appreciate you taking the time to come on. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Big uh, number Smith. Just um, technically, uh, we should have stand so that we can carry what we can do easily. Uh, probably just to the side where you are now, thank you. And can I just say that we commended Graham Smith for his very positive and uh, uh, submission this morning. Um, you can do it wrong. You do it wrong. Oh, I'm not sorry. Okay, so um, I'm here as a rate player from Tauru, I've got high poked in the ward of the Swan and Tart, because obviously they're combined. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in both uh, areas. Mm -hmm. And the submission covers a lot of issues, but there's one issue I want to focus on, which is Lindsay Rowe. You will note in here, of the six issues you've asked, there is only one that occurs to sale of an asset, the land at Lindsay Rowe. Everyone else is getting money or getting fee increases, but this is a sale. And I object to community owned land being sold. Um, we have a group that's formed that is opposing this, and there is five issues I want to run through. Firstly, inadequate consultation. The document that was allowed for consultation did not allow for adequate comment, and I'll show you why. Each of the boxes had a comment box. Here is no comment box. Of all the boxes, there's plenty of space on this, but for some reason the form was left off. Now it makes the people on the tarp feel this is a plate of conflict and that the council is planning to sell this come hell or high water. It limited the option for informed feedback, and I understand from watching yesterday that a lot of people in Fidianga are going, tick, sell this land because they haven't talked to the one of my bar tar people and there hasn't been enough information available. Secondly, the community wants to keep this site. 
There is an extensive business case produced, which you would have seen from one of the previous submitters. It's actually fully funded. It doesn't require any money. It just requires keeping the land and not selling it. These are the people that are involved. The Lions already have a base there. There's community services, Garstity, community hall, community pension theatre. There's a whole group of people that want to use this land, which is currently lying vacant. But we weren't allowed to submit this as part of the LTP. There were, there were questions asked that should be part of it, and it was denied. So there's an issue of natural justice sitting in here that may actually um, resolve itself as a, a issue. Thirdly, the issue of the land was taken under public works act. So under section 40, it has to be referred back to the previous owners if it's going to be solved, if it's declared surplus. There, I have already had indications that there'll be legal procedures if this doesn't occur. Most of all, this is what's really annoying the Wakamata people, the $3 million from their asset is going into the black hole known as the Collective um, Consolidated Fund. There's no knowledge where this money is going to. If it was being sold and it was going back to Wakamata, maybe there might be some validity, but there's not. And so where is this going to go? Is it going to go on the waste of $4 million you're spending on upgrading the waste goods? Why are we asset stripping Wakamata? It says here they're planning to use the funds to reduce debts. Now, I've been here a year ago arguing why do we have this debt? Because there was a failure to monitor OPEX, which led to a $6 million blowout in OPEX. OPEX should have been monitored monthly. It wasn't. And you guys, as the new councillors, all landed on the 19th of September, newly born, finding you had a huge budget blowout, which is why you're now planning to sell off assets. <coughs> this is what should have happened. This was used to happen, and it was axed by the CEO when he came out. This is the budget blowout in 2019, and I draw your attention particularly to the $2 million on external contractors for the NZTA shortfall and the Pudianga Town, Town Centre. Someone thought that NZTA would give $2 million to a road that is not a state highway. Um, so can you hear this to the LTP? Yes, LTP? I can, absolutely. Where is this $3 million going to? Well, perhaps one of the cars going to lose it then to pay for the $2 million shortfall that was the budget blowout in Pukianga. Maybe it's going to lose the $4 million for the new wheelie bins that you're proposing in 2023. And in my submission, I don't think there's a need for more wheelie bins. We already have a yellow wheelie bin, a green wheelie bin, a blue bag. Why are we spending $4 million? My conclusion, it's wrong to sell community-owned land, particularly when it's covering OPEX blowouts. Secondly, this is our land. It's community land. It needs to be kept for future generations and not sold off now. One of the community has a plan to revitalise this whole area, and the costings in this document show that it, it's fully funded by government agencies and others, so there's no cost to council for doing this. So our plea is that we delay decisions on selling this land. Give us a chance to actually make it work. In page three, page 13, option three, which you'll see in your document, the no-sale option, choosing not to sell, will not have an impact on rates or on debt. So it's not like it's going to hurt the council. It just means you won't have money to put in the consolidated fund. Thank it's you, Ben. Are there any questions of them? One minute. Yeah, Once the land's sold, it's gone from the people forever. Thank you. Are there any questions of Ben? There being none. Thank you, Ben. Are there any further submissions? No, but there may be legal ones coming your way. Thank you. Right, we will now adjourn.
No, it's not because the mother's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, people. We're now going to break and reconvene. Uh, Are there two people that were going to come between the world and one that they, they're not coming? Right. Okay. Cool. So that's unfortunate. Thank you, people.